Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, and beginning in verse 8, as we continue the sermon series that we started a couple of weeks ago for the summer, what it means to have a firm faith in a crumbling world, Hebrews chapter 11, and beginning in verse 8. Word of God says, By faith, Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Perhaps his most well-known sermon, John Piper tells the story of two women serving as missionaries overseas who were killed in a tragic accident. Two women, both of whom had been single all of their lives, countries that were isolated, desolated, away from the headlines, away from the news. Tragic deaths. And he asked the question, were their lives a waste the same question the secular media asked when Jim Elliott and missionaries to Ecuador were martyred by the Aka Indians. In fact, it's the question that has been asked throughout the ages by people who have given their lives for their faith. Was it worth it? He goes on to say that the real tragedy is not in people who give their lives for the faith. The real tragedy is in a Reader's Digest article about a person who worked their whole life, was able to retire early, and now they spend all of their days out on the beach collecting seashells. And Piper imagines what the judgment day is going to be like when people are standing before the Lord and he says to them, Lord, look at these seashells I have collected for you. Aren't they glorious? Lord, look at these automobiles. Look at this stamp collection. Look at my houses. Look at the stuff that I've got. Isn't it great? See, the great tragedy in life is not that you die. The great tragedy in life is that you never really live. And the Bible says that most people will spend their lives just like an actor on a stage. The curtain will fall, and they will drop off that stage never having accomplished that for which they were born. Not so for people of God. Not so for men and women of faith who believed that what they were dying for was worth dying for. And if you are ever going to live for Christ, you are going to have to get used to the idea of being and living uncomfortably. Because if you're in your comfort zone today, it's not God who puts you there. He comforts you, but He doesn't make you comfortable. And one day He comes to a man who is known as Abram, later known as Abraham, living outside of Ur of the Chaldees, and He says, Abraham, man who is about to retire, man who is apparently very wealthy by any standards, man who is getting ready to live out the golden years, the sunset years. He says, Abraham, you got to get up and you got to go. <laughs> Where am I going? Can't tell you that. When will I get there? Don't know that either. And God commands Abraham to step out in faith. But I want you to notice what the Scripture says that has application for us today because the Bible doesn't just say that he went. It says when he was called to go. See, when God puts a calling on your life, he puts a fire 
in your soul. He puts a throbbing in your bones. And when you don't do what God has called you to do, you are the most miserable person on the face of the earth. You see, lack of obedience always stems from lack of faith. If you don't believe what God says, you won't do what He commands. And the Scripture commends Abraham not simply for his obedience, but because he believed God. He took God at His word, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He took God at His word. He believed God even when every possible circumstance told Him not to. He left His home as a senior citizen, journeyed to a barren desert, and then lived as an upper class camper dwelling in tents for the rest of His life. He was called to go to a foreign land, to believe a foreign promise, to have a child at a foreign age, to die a foreign death, and to do it all by a foreign faith. But God called Him. So he went. His family didn't even see the completion of the promise. In fact, it goes on to say that having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles or pilgrims on the earth. But when he was called, he obeyed. You say, that's Abraham. Oh, no. If you're a child of God, that's you. The calling of God on your life. You say only pastors, those in vocational or ministry, are called. <laughs> Not in the Bible. And he says, here's the thing about those who are called. You don't have to know where you're going. You just have to know that you've been called. Because whom he called, them he justified. Whom he justified, them he glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, shall he not freely give us all things? Who shall lay any charge to God's elect, to the called? It is God who justifies us. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died, yea, rather, that is risen again and now lives to make intercession for us. I would say to you that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Because when God calls you, He enables you. You just have to be called. It is an effectual calling, the Scripture tells us. That is, God is the one who does it. He is the one who keeps it. And let me tell you this, no matter how many times you feel outnumbered in your life, in your family, in your place, one man, one woman with God is always in the majority. Abraham Lincoln was told by one of his generals during the Civil War, he said, President Lincoln, surely God is on our side. Lincoln responded, I'd rather be on God's side than him be on my side. God be for us, who can be against us? Abraham was called, and he wasn't just called, he was called to go. It's interesting, the imperatives that are mentioned throughout Scripture in the Old and the New Testament. The Scripture tells us, come, see, behold, look, God sent His Son. God gave His Son. Walk in the Lord. And now He tells us to go. Faith is never passive in the believer's life. It is always active. It's not enough to put off sin. I also have to put on righteousness. You are never driving in neutral with God. You are either moving towards Him or you are moving away from Him. But there is no middle ground. That's why Jesus says, I would that you were hot, I would that you were cold, but don't you be lukewarm. And He calls His people to go. To go and to share the good news. Jesus' final command on this earth is go. Go and make disciples. This past week, I had the privilege of attending the Southern Baptist Convention in Phoenix this year. It was 113 degrees when I left. That's a lot of dry heat. And they say it's dry heat, but it really doesn't make any difference. It still feels like it's in your face. One of the neat things about the, the convention this year was the International Mission Board's commissioning ceremony. The ones who we send out through cooperative program dollars, 10% of everything we take in goes to those causes, and they commissioned these missionaries in a public service, and they gave some of their names and some of the places they would be going, and then there were some of those standing behind the missionaries, back off, it was a huge stage, they were probably 30 feet back, and they didn't have the lights raised for them, and the lights dimmed, 
And the reason is because they were going to such hostile places in the world that to put their names on the screen would put them in danger. And then they had the families of these missionaries gather around, and they gathered out, they held these banners up for different nations of the church, came and prayed for them. And for many of them, it would be the last time they would see their families for the next three years because that's the commission that you make. But God called them to go. He says, whatever area God has placed you in life, your primary mission for being placed on this earth is to give Him glory. And the way that you give Him glory is by sharing Him with everyone you possibly can, living and showing and sharing out God's love. The Scripture says something about Abraham that you may find familiar. I like what it says. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So often we spend life trying to decide what exactly it is that God wants me to do. God, if you just write it out for me, that would help me to be able to do your will. If I knew exactly what it was, then I would do it. If Abraham had waited until he knew everything that God had called him to do, he would have been waiting a long time. And here's the truth of the matter. It's not nearly as important as what you do for God as what he does in you. Abraham was called, he went, he believed, he obeyed. He has no idea what he's supposed to do. He just knows he's been called to go. And the thing about Abraham and the thing about us is that everywhere Abraham goes, God had already been there first. The Bible says the same thing about Jesus. He has already suffered in our place. Abraham didn't know where he was going, but God did. The land was his. He just didn't even know it yet. And he went out not knowing where he was going. I wonder if that phrase doesn't describe every believer's life, if you think about it. I remember sitting at lunch about 10 years ago on the campus of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I was starting my Master of Divinity there, and there was a a guy who I just met who was starting out at Boyce College, and I asked him where he was from, and he told me, Hallsville, Kentucky. Now, I had spent almost 23 years on this earth and had never heard of that town before. I got a call from a pastor church committee. Now I know full well where it is and live in it. The same thing was true for Buffalo, Kentucky, where I served for five years. We used to go there every year for our family Thanksgiving, and the family tradition was we really would get lost no matter what route we took, the shortcuts that are out there. We would inevitably get lost. I got so lost, I got stuck there for five years serving in the Lord's church. I've been lost several times by a GPS. You know, they'll get you in range, but sometimes they won't get you exactly where you want to go. I've been to several of your homes and gotten lost along the way. And I would add to this phrase for Abraham, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Maybe we would add the phrase, and he went out not knowing what he was doing. I remember how in the world, thinking, how am I going to be able to prepare a sermon every single week? I remember thinking that, thinking I would have no idea how to do that. Some of you think, well, I'm still wondering that too. Give me a little while. We'll see. The Lord provided. I remember thinking under my leadership, the church that I served first would just die because I didn't have the gifts. God grew it. And it seems like it's in the inadequacy, it's in the ability where you have to depend on the Lord that God most uses you. And He doesn't do it through comfort. He doesn't do it through the status quo. Abraham lives in tents, but in the New Testament, Paul is making tents. There's no permanent dwelling for the people of God. He doesn't live in a house made with hands, and yet that's exactly how he would have it to be. See, if God tells you where you're going, or what you're doing, I I don't know if we could take parts of it. I've seen families reconciled that I never thought would be reconciled. I've seen God use people that I never thought he would use, but I've also seen families go unreconciled. I've also seen people who were once serving the Lord now falling away. And in the midst of all that, God hasn't called us to depend on the circumstances or even to depend on the seasons within his church. He has called us just to trust him, to believe God, to follow him. And the reason is what he says later on. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. And so all we know is that God has prepared for us 
For everyone who claims Jesus, a city, a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And so hear me this morning. It's not nearly as important to know where you're going or what you're doing as it is to know who you're following. Abraham believed God. And I want you to see that it wasn't his obedience that received his faith. It was his faith that prompted his obedience. The scripture tells us in Romans 4 that Abraham was justified by his faith. And so he obeyed God because he believed God. And the scripture will say there is a level of obedience that once you have seen God work, that this is the confidence that you have in him, that if you ask anything according to his will, he will give it to you. That the more that you trust God and the more that you obey God, the more of his joy, the more of life he gives to you as a result. And then the scripture tells us why Abraham was able to do what he did. Because he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker was God. The reason that Abraham was able to persevere was because he had a vision of the kingdom of God in his heart. I was reading this past week, Augustine, City of God, one of the early church fathers, and he writes about the absolute turmoil that took place when the city of Rome had been sacked You may not know this, but Rome had been in power for 1,100 years. It was a thousand-year reign, the greatest city the world had ever seen up until that point. And Augustine hears this from afar. He hears the cries of people who have received this news. And he says, I looked out at this once great city which enthralled the world. You can imagine New York City or Washington, D.C. or some famous city in the world just being there and being taken. But as he began to consider the fall of the Roman Empire, he also began to point people to another kingdom, a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Many of us wonder what America's place will be in the world in the next few years, and we can't predict that. Many of us wonder what the world will even look like in a few years. As connected as we are, as much as it's made things better, it's also made things that much more dangerous. It's made things that much more difficult. And yet in the world in which we live, we had best be reminded that there is another kingdom for which we strive. A city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And the scripture tells us that that kingdom doesn't seem like much. It is as a, as a mustard seed. It is an, an invisible kingdom. We don't look for the things which are seen, but for the things which are not seen. But once that kingdom has grown, there is nothing you can do to stop it. There is an everlasting kingdom which will have no end. It lets us know. So in the meantime, we walk, we believe, we go. Pilgrim's Progress details so much of this journey. Pilgrim travels from the place in which he was to the slaw of despair. He goes through Doubting Castle. He fights the giants who were there and the trials of the wicked come at him. And at one point along the way, as he's beginning to consider his journey, he receives this word from the interpreter. And the interpreter says to him that many in this world desire to have everything now. And so he reminds him of the scripture, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. The rich man receives comfort in this life, but now he's tormented in the next life. And Lazarus, who sat outside of his gates, is tormented in this life, but is comforted in the next life. And Pilgrim responds, Then I perceive it is not best to covet things that are now, but to wait for things to come. That is the desire for the believer, not to covet the things that are now, but to covet earnestly the greater things. I like what Wendell Berry says, there is a day when the road neither comes nor goes, and the way is not a way, but a place. He looked for a city which had foundations. Builder and maker is God. Abraham believed God. So must we. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the sermon video today. If you found it helpful, would you consider sharing it with a family member or a friend? That would help us to spread this ministry and get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You can also find more information on our website, barryefields.com. Again, thanks for watching.